Welcome to the show. You may not recognize my voice because it's never been on this podcast before. My name is Cole and I am, among other things, such as a key searcher, a former freelance journalist out of Canada. Now, George Ward has interviewed many prominent figures in the hunt for Brian Price's casks for this podcast. But it dawned on me one day that no one has ever interviewed George himself, uh, as he too is a prominent hunter. So I thought I would ask if I could do just that. And thankfully, he's agreed to be on the other side of the microphone for once. Uh, welcome to your show, George. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me on my show. Uh, how are you doing today? You know, I'm doing all right. Um, we're all sort of locked up because of the coronavirus. So we're just sitting around playing video games. I don't think I've changed my pajamas in a couple of days. Being kind of slummy, it, it's really nice. That probably makes a few of us. Have you been <laughs> uh, doing any secret work in this time? Um, a little, uh, man, I don't really have time to do much on my own. Um, I, I've, I've set up, I talked to John Frazier a couple of days ago and he wants to get together at the Fountain of Youth and do some digs. And actually he said, uh, we're going to stand around and drink beer while other people dig for us, which is, <laughs> um, other, other than that, man, no, no, not much. No, John Fraser, does, does John Fraser have, like, does he present theories to you about the Fountain of Youth? He does. Um, and he like gives people my phone number and tells them to call like, okay, so here's, here's the way it works. Uh, sometimes John does get an idea and he wants to talk about it. Um, and that's fine. He'll just call me or he'll meet me. Like he'll, uh, he'll see me when I'm at the park or something. And we'll just talk about his ideas. He's got a very good one. He wants to dig and, uh, um, he's been sort of held back because tourists are always in the park. So I'm sure during the shutdown, we're going to dig his spot that he's had for the last year or so. Or right. uh, people will come to him and they'll be like, hey, John, I have this idea. And they'll present it to him and he'll be like, well, I have, I have no idea if that's viable or not. So he's like, here's George's phone number. Call him at 1130 at night. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm t- I, I take it you get a lot of these calls every day? I do. I get um, – uh, so calls not so much. Um, I'm really, really guarded with my phone number. Um, I probably get a call every couple of weeks. Emails though, dude. 15 emails a day on a good day it's crazy do you not have to ask do you have an email account just for the secret and one just for george ward um well the podcast has an email address uh but bradley bradley mainly mans that um but i mean i didn't think the secret like when i first got into the secret it wasn't very big and i was really free with all of my contact information so i just gave out all of my personal stuff i mean if you dig back in q for t far enough you'll probably find my cell number somewhere <laughs> um so i never I, I didn't really have the foresight to set up a separate email address so people just have mine right. so like on one hand i'll get you know my insurance invoice and mm-hmm. five minutes later i'll get a, a key searcher like can i dig in peoria yeah <laughs> uh well that actually leads me to my next question and i mean you've touched on this a few like uh, many different ways uh on a few different episodes of the podcast but how exactly did you discover byron price's puzzles um me and brett uh we used to do these very very complex reddit puzzles um and there's a podcast out called rabbits which is about uh, numbers puzzles. It's about this like secret cabal of people who are, who create these puzzles that are, are, are difficult number one to find. And then when you find them, they're extremely difficult to solve. And the way you know them is because they're numbered. They're like puzzle one, puzzle two, puzzle three, puzzle four. That podcast was loosely based on the puzzles that Brett and I used to do. So on Reddit, you can find puzzle one through puzzle. I think they're up to nine now. Uh, during the creation of one of these puzzles. I, uh, I, w- I was just, th- these puzzles are cipher based and then location based as well. Like you have to be in a city to be able to solve them. Uh, and one of them was in St. Augustine. Uh, before St. Augustine, I was, I was looking around trying to find new ideas for this puzzle. And I happened upon the secret 
right? And I was I was reading about the secret and I was like, man, this sounds really interesting. I wish something like this was in my town. And then I read the proposed cities and I was like, holy shit, there's one in St. Augustine. <laughs> and then I read, I read the, the St. Augustine verse in the painting and I was like, I know exactly where this is. Yeah. So did you first, like w- when you were first reading about it, was it through the book or did you like, w- there was the wiki, of course, that everyone's familiar with. Was that uh, a contributor to that as well? I honestly think it was Wikipedia. I honestly right. think I like, I first found out about it via Wikipedia. And then I think I found Q for T after that. It was a while before I found the actual wiki. Oh, okay. Yeah. I spent a lot of time on the secret without much information at first. It was like, uh, here's your verse. Here's your painting. That's all you've got. Right. Um, it was, it was a while before I started searching out sort of other sites. Um, but yeah, that was, that was how I found it. That's really interesting. Now, Towards the end there, you sort of mentioned, um, you know, going to, to the wiki, but having, you know, working on it with very little information. Um, and I wonder when you work on the secret, uh, how do you like, how do you decide how to work out the clues? Because as a newcomer, there's so much room for possibility in regards to what is a clue and what isn't, um, what methods work and what might not, because there's so little actual confirming information out there. So when you first started, what did you do to escape the the vastness of possibility and decide what leads were worth following? I think working on puzzles, like being the sort of, I don't want to say puzzle master, but puzzle master of a puzzle before working on someone else's puzzle helped out a lot. Right. Because something that I realized was there were probably four of us that did these puzzles on Reddit and you could, as a user, if you, if you went through the series of puzzles, you could start to figure out which one of us four made which individual puzzle, because all, all people who make puzzles make them sort of the same, right? Like Kit Williams masquerade. That was very, very, very hard right? It took a little while for people to solve, for people to figure out. But when his next book came out, it was solved pretty quickly because people understood Kit's method, right? And I sort of feel like Byron's the same way. Byron's not a, um, Byron's not a experienced puzzle master. You know, he doesn't, he hasn't written several puzzles. He's done one. And you have to assume that because he's done this one book of 12 puzzles, that all the puzzles are kind of going to follow the same method, you know, maybe not exactly, but they're going to be pretty close. So I always figured if we've got two that are solved and this guy's probably going to follow the same method, then the rest of them are going to follow. The rest of them are going to be kind of similar to the first two that were solved. And that's, that's how I've always approached them. Like if it's, really comp if the solution for me is really complex and far reaching um and not sort of uh not simple and and contained like chicago and cleveland were then i just don't feel like it's right so that that's always been my my philosophy behind solving these just keep it simple keep it simple when not not really not just keep it simple and just keep it similar right so you see a lot of similarities then between the solves of, of Cleveland and, and Chicago. Like, the, you know, I, I think I've heard you say in podcasts before that, you know, anything that you see in the image basically is going to be at the site kind of thing. Um, and you think that follows suit for Chicago and I guess now Boston? Well, I feel like I feel like what you feel like what you need to see in the image is obvious in Chicago and Cleveland, right? It's just right there in front of your face. Boston is a little different in that it, it seems like, like JJP was talking about an EU. He's, he's more trying to tell you a story than give you this like one-to-one comparison of two different objects. Um, yeah. Uh, I feel like there is one thing at every site that's going to be obvious. Um, Something that the the similarity that I think that's most important between Chicago, between between Chicago, Boston and Cleveland is that, number one, the verse is very this is this right. It's not very reaching. It's very one to one. Um, Feel at home is home plate. Seek the columns or the columns in the painting. You know, you know, uh, Socrates Pindarna Pelis that's on the wall. You, You don't have to take a leap. It's very this is exactly this. Um, and in the painting, it's sort of the same way. Um, you know, the water tower is a water tower, the terminal tower, that's the terminal tower, uh, home plate's home plate. Boston's a little different to me because the, the, 
Um, the painting seems to be telling more of a story like with the Boston Pops or with the Boston Globe. Uh, but other than those couple of things, yeah, they, they all seem to be very similar one to one. This is this. So let me ask you this. Are the verse and the image creating a path or is it saying when you're standing at the spot, this is what you'll see? I mean, it really, de- in my opinion, it really depends, right? Some of these verses, some of these verses are obviously a path. Milwaukee, it's obviously a path. It's telling you to do things. It's telling you to pass things. It's telling you to travel places, walk certain distances. Some of them don't tell you to do anything, right? The Florida verse It doesn't tell you to do anything. It tells you look for these things. Um, So are some of them a path? Like it's hard to give a a definitive answer. Like do these walk, do these make you travel a path or do they not? Yes and no. Some of them seem to, some of them don't. And I guess it's really up to the searcher to determine which is which. Yeah, I suppose. Um, Do you have any pet peeves in regard to this hunt? Oh. (laughs) Like any that really stand out? Um, I really, really hate the words, all solutions are valid until a cask is out of the ground. I hate those words because they're not, um, they're, they're really not, not all solutions are valid. Not all solutions are the same. Not all ideas are on the same level. Um, I feel like if you can show me that, that, you know, your ideas work with, they're simple. They're one to one, and they work in relation to the other to the other puzzles. That's great. I'll buy it. What's What's not valid is when you start to step past that. When you like like Matt's great highway theory, right? Um, in San Francisco, G and H are backwards on the lady's dress in the San Francisco image, right? Now we all ninety nine point nine percent of us associate that with the Ghirardelli sign. The only person really who doesn't is Matt. And Matt thinks that's Great Highway. He thinks there was some map back in the day and Great Highway was written on the map in the right font, but we can't find that map and you got to revert. Like that to me is a leap. You've got G and H. They're in the proper font. They look exactly like the Ghirardelli statue. That's a great match to me. This Great Highway thing, not so much. Um, So yeah, so not all ideas are the same is what I'm trying to say. And that's, that's a big pet peeve of mine. And there is, there is levels to the um, credibility of every idea, right? I think so. Uh, it's really hard to say, you know, because these, it is a puzzle and they're not solved. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Um, like who, who's the authority who's to say um, whose idea is better than another's. Like, it's not my job to say if your idea is better than somebody else's. It's just whether or not I buy it, I guess. No. And I suppose, as kind of an aside, doing what you do with the podcast and, and I guess the Facebook pages as well, like it sort of, it paints you into a position where you, like people think of you as the authority, whether you act as such or not, right? Yeah, yeah, it does. I try to make it clear, I'm not. Like, I don't know anything more than you know, you know? Right. I don't I don't have a cask. I'm, you know, no. I'm not an authority. It's just, you know, my opinion. Right. Now, um, aside from St. Augustine, is there other uh, secret puzzles that you look at, like, um, I guess, more than the others? Uh, Charleston, I look at a lot. San Francisco, I look at uh, a fairly decent amount. Um, I've been trying to help uh, Phoenix with with Montreal, whether he knows it or not. I'm just not like Montreal is hard, man, because everything about Montreal is written in French. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah, the, like if I had to pick um, my stronger puzzles, it's probably uh, St. Augustine, um, Charleston and San Francisco. And then my my like weak puzzles, the ones that I really don't know that much about, it's like New York. I don't know that much about New York or Houston. All in all, do you think that there is a like a do you think some of the puzzles are harder to kind of piece together and i'm saying harder in like the video game sense where like the first one is easier and things get harder as you go along do you think these are put together in in such a way probably um or at least byron probably tried to do it that way um i think no, no matter what, though, the, the difficulty in these puzzles, it seems to be Byron used information that he had on site. Right. Um, nothing, nothing in Chicago. Like I said before, you don't need to open a book 
to solve Chicago. He used what he had on site. Yeah, the same way with Cleveland. You don't have to open a book for Cleveland. He used what he had on site. So mm-hmm. the difficulty in these puzzles seems to be putting yourself in a position where you have all of the information that Byron had. And so much time's passed that things have been changed or things have been removed. If you take two things away from Chicago, it's really difficult to solve it, you know? And I think that's where the difficulty lies for us now. So many things in these parks have been changed or have been moved. So we're just not operating with the same amount of information that Byron had when he created the puzzle. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, having to have, you know, having to put yourself in the, in his position, like that's basically at the end of the day, the microcosmic message of the whole book is just be where I was. Yeah, it, it seems to be to me. And some people don't think of it that way. You know, some people are are going, you know, into the back of the book to try to find clues to put themselves in whatever place Byron wanted them to be. Or, or some people are drawing historical connections to different parks and different lines in the verse. So who's to say I'm right and they're wrong, you know? Um, but if I were to, if 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 Chicago weren't solved right now and you were to take away the Lincoln statue and and like rename congress i don't know who we'd be able to solve it with the trees gone and whatever or if you were brian and andy are the perfect example if that picture of those words hadn't been posted to google they would have never solved it right you know yeah no absolutely they they found that site by literally googling those words and (laughs) if that website hadn't been put up they would have never solved it like brian was on his way to philadelphia to dig when they when they found Cleveland. Right, I remember that interview. Um, can you describe the most bizarre theory that you've been presented in the last, I don't know, five years or so? The most bizarre? Hands down, there is a guy, and I won't say who it was, um, there's a guy who thinks that, uh, that, that Byron Price stumbled upon the location of the Templar treasures and that the secret, the book, was supposed to point you to the Templar treasures. And because he wrote the book and pointed people to the Templar treasures, a secret cabal of assassins murdered Byron Price. Um, they drove, they, they, what was it? They called him on the phone as he was leaving the synagogue and did some sort of distraction, causing him to be hit by a bus. Wow. Like legit, that's, that's, that's an idea. Was that something on the on like Facebook or something? No, that was a personally to me story. Yikes! Yeah, so that's that's probably the craziest one. Um, the others are are you know ones that everybody else knows, like the wolves, um, you know, and vectors and stuff like that. But that's that's probably the most out there that I've heard. Yeah, I think that's definitely the most out there I've heard too. Um, now a lot of you, a lot of the crazy ideas that you do here and, and also a large majority of the really good ones we hear nowadays do come on the Facebook pages now. And I wanted to know as you know, the admin for most of the ones that are, um, you know, populated quite heavily, you know, what's it like to be at the, at the head of such a storm of conversation? Um, Man, it used to be so much fun. Like I could take in everything before there were over 5,000 members on the main page and a couple of thousand on all the other ones. I could read every post and it was great, right? There was a lot of, a lot of discussion, but there's so much talk now that I I can't even, I can't take it all in. Right. Um, It gets a little crazy. I I feel like I spend more of my time now um, putting out people's fires than I do engaging in conversation, which kind of sucks. Yeah. Uh, But you know, it is what it is. Right. Um, so I want to get a little philosophical on you for a moment. Alan Watts once said uh, he's an English writer who moved to the States in like the 19, 20, late 1920s, I think it was. But anyways, that's irrelevant. But he once said that the behavior of an organism is inseparable from the behavior of its environment. Would you say that that accurately describes the, the Facebook pages? The behavior of an organism is inseparable from the, from the behavior of its environment? Um. No, no, I wouldn't say that the Facebook pages are like that because I I can, the Facebook pages get crazy and there are still certain members who just keep cool and help out. They don't go crazy with the crowd. Um, Some people do. Sometimes when things go crazy, you know, it seems like everybody's going nuts, 
But if you read the comments, you find that one person who's level headed, trying to calm everybody down, trying to just give people information. So no, I, I wouldn't say, no, I wouldn't say that. I, I don't, unless I'm completely misunderstanding the question. I, I think there's always uh, several people who just keep calm and, and do what they do. Right. No, that's absolutely a fair answer. Um, who do you, who do you go to, you know, when you need info on things like history or getting permission or anything like that? Like, how did you come to, like, I know you talked to a lot of park rangers and things like that in, in your past and in your hunt. And like, is that just something you decided you were going to do is just go and start talking to these people in order to get that information? So we'll, we'll break, break this up and break this up into two questions or at least two answers, right? Number okay. one, who do I go to for history? Right. Um, so the reason that the, the podcast started as a result of a group of friends, right? A group of friends who got together um, and just that we started our own little secret Facebook page and we were like, we just want to work together solving this. Right. And I met um, a guy named Chris Preacher and Chris Preacher is like an encyclopedia of the secret and an encyclopedia of the cities of the secret. Anything you could ever want to know about anything, Chris knows. Someone once made a joke that Chris Preacher could provide to you a love letter that Byron wrote Sandy in like 1982. He's just he's an encyclopedia of knowledge. Um, The podcast team itself came together to help everybody out. Each of us lives in a cask city and we all have an encyclopedic knowledge of the cask city. So if I want to know anything from history, I just go to, I go to my friends, right. um, learning how to approach park members. I was just sort of lucky in that respect. I, uh, worked for about five years in parks and rec in, in Florida. Um, so I learned, uh, the types of people who work in parks and rec, uh, the hierarchy of, of, uh, you know, who to go to. Like if, if you find a park maintenance worker, I know who his boss is. I knew who their boss is. I know the chain of command. Right? right. And I, because I was one of these people, I know how to approach them and get them to let me dig in their park. I know what they're worried about. Right. right. I know the problems that they're worried about being caused. So I know how to address those things. Um, I think that's what helped me the most. And then I'm also, I'm a firefighter. So, and I'm sort of, I sit on the board of a lot of firefighters. So I have to work with, uh, um, like the chamber of commerce or our county board of directors. So I know how, just because of my past, I know how to interact with these people and I know what information they're looking for and what problems that I could cause and how to explain to them that I won't cause those problems. Um, so really that's, that's what it was. My past helped me with that more than anything else. Nice. So, I mean, break it down. It would be very easy to say that it would be easy to just jump a fence and dig a hole. But in your opinion, it would actually be easier to go through the proper channels to get your your dig permits and things like that. Like, granted, it's a small inconvenience, maybe for waiting on time or parks simply won't let you do it. But, you know, it is at the end of the day, still an easier way to do it. Right. I think what most people focus on is this hole, right? They want to dig the hole. And what, what they forget is that one hole, it's probably wrong. And a week later, you're probably going to want to dig another hole, right? So you can jump a fence and you can dig that one hole and risk getting caught. And if it's wrong, you got to risk it again. And then you got to risk it again and you got to risk it again. It's much easier to take a couple of days and go meet your park staff, you know, and talk to them and explain what you're doing. Then you have permission for every single hole you want to dig. And let's say you no longer want to dig in this, this park, right? You want to dig in another park. Well, those people that you already have a relationship with odds are they've got a relationship with the people in the other park and they can put in a good word for you. Like a perfect example is, um, ultimately we want to dig in Charleston, right? I don't really like Charleston's very, very shut down but I'm good friends with John Frazier and John Frazier is good friends with the parks department in Charleston. And he's offered to put in a good word so we can talk to them. So you see what I'm saying? Like what's more important than digging that hole is building a foundation of friendships that will help you dig future holes. And the report. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Um, are there any casts that you think are, you know, maybe gone or, you know, there's little point to try and acquire anymore. No, no. I mean, so, um, we were going to release all this information, right? Um, that was something we were going to do, uh, the podcast team and then various other 
members of the community have uh, uh, garnered information from emailing Byron and talking to JJP and talking to people involved in the hunt. And we've gained all this information. We were going to release it. We were going to put names to things. Um, we can't, we can't do that anymore. We obviously, we can't put names to things, but we can still sort of release the information and you just have to trust it's correct. Um, one of the things I've been told is there is one you can't find. You just can't find it. It's not, it's not recoverable anymore. And there are two that the parks have changed. I say parks, I shouldn't. The places have changed so much that it will be very, very difficult. Odds are the one that's not recover recoverable is Roanoke. But I don't know that for a fact. That's just, you know, my opinion. It's Roanoke. But does that mean that it's not worth trying to figure out, A, the solution, or B, whether or not it's recoverable? No. Like, you should, it's always worth trying to figure it out. Um, okay, so for this next little bit, I was hoping you could, I've kind of just been um, observing Facebook pages over the last little while and, and kind of seeing the way seeing the the major topics and things that people talk about. And I was hoping I could get your take on what I call some secret myths. Uh, and maybe even if they are myths, uh, I know one of them for a fact is not, but um, it's a point that I think needs to be continually driven home. Uh, so the first one of these is you do not need a permit to dig. You don't really, you don't need a permit. Like you don't need a piece of paper that tells you you're allowed to dig. And in most places you just need permission. You need somebody to say somebody in authority to say, yeah, do your whole, do whatever you want. Um, and that's really easy to get permits. Not so much permits. When you start applying for permits, you got to have like a business with business insurance and you've got to have a, a purpose for getting that permit other than I want to see what's underground. You know, you got to have dig tickets. You, you got to have all kinds of things to get a permit. Have you ever had to get a permit? Uh, um, <laughs> so before I had a relationship with John Frazier, uh, I took a GPR into the fountain of youth without permission. Okay. And they asked me if I came back with it to have not, maybe not a, it would be the equivalent of a permit. It would be written permission from the park with insurance and a purpose, uh, oh, okay. I, like a documented purpose. Like I right. needed a, uh, I would, had to like write a thesis or whatever. And have, have a purpose. <laughs> cool. That's as close as as close as I've ever come to someone asking me to get a permit. Right. Um, okay. Next myth. There is a cask in St. Louis. I don't know. Nobody's been able to prove that to me. Like nobody's been able to even show me a sliver of evidence that there is a cask in St. Louis, but that doesn't mean there's not, there's a lot of weird stuff in the book about St. Louis, you know, a lot of weird stuff in the book about St. Louis, but nobody's been able to show any, any little bit of evidence that, that there's something there. Um, people take the Montreal, painting and and some sometimes the verse and sometimes they switch verses around and they say this is the st louis you know painting but they can't show evidence that is stronger than the evidence for montreal and you you know you can sp spread that across to all the paintings you can take the milwaukee painting and say it's for st louis but you can't show me a better match than was it uh city hall in that painting you see what i'm saying um so is there one in st louis it's possible. So here's, here's another I've been told. I've been told that the searchers have had the cities correct for a very, very long time. That's not to say that they've had the matches correct. That's not to say that the correct paintings have been paired with the correct verses, but I've been told that the cities are correct. Take that with a grain of salt. Cause I've been lied to before, but but I mean, there's a challenge to that too. I think that there, you know, Byron himself wrote that uh, the response wasn't it, where he said Saint Louis, but he also said that the what did he say the location was right, but the city was wrong or something. Byron's response was, "You were right about Saint Louis, but wrong about the location," which is meaningless. That email is meaningless unless you know what he was responding to, and we don't. Um, Johan, I believe, was the author. Um, he could have very well sent uh, an email to Byron that was like, St. Louis is a beautiful city. And I think the cask is buried in this park. And Byron could be like, yeah, you're right. St. Louis is a beautiful city, but you're wrong about it. You know where the cask is buried. Um, or he could have said, I think St. Louis is, is 
uh, an integral part of this puzzle. And I think this cask is buried in, you know, this park in St. Louis. And Byron's like, yeah, you're right about St. Louis because of St. Louis Cathedral, maybe in New Orleans, but you're wrong about the location, right? The, the context of that email is dependent on the context of e- the email before it. And we don't know what was said. It's never been released. Hmm. It's still out there. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've, St. Louis is, is interesting in the book. Like I said, mm. there's a lot of stuff about St. Louis in the book, but no one has ever been able to give even a sliver of, of a, of a, of a match in either the image or the verse that's as good as any others that, that that's able to take away anything from any other city. Right. Um, okay. So we've discussed permission. Now, um, another essential piece of the puzzle, it seems these days is Josh Gates. Uh, in order to dig these, do you need to contact Josh Gates? <laughs> I would say no. Um, look, Josh Gates likes the secret. He's done three episodes about it. So he, he obviously likes this hunt. Um, but I, he's not, he's not an integral step in solving the puzzle. You know, he can't hook you up with the, the price family any easier than anyone else can. Right. If you take a picture of a cask and put it on Facebook, people are going to contact you. You don't need to contact anybody else. And out of the uh, hundreds of people that have told me I've emailed Josh Gates, I haven't heard one say that he's responded. Right. So that's got to tell you something. Yeah. All right. The last of these myths that I've brought up is that uh, the field guide matters to the search. What do you think about that? Maybe, 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 probably not, but maybe it seems in the history of the way the book was written. um, It seems that Sean and Ted were writing a book. uh, I forget the name of it. Something like the, the mythical fairies of central park or something like that. Um, they were, they were writing a book, but they couldn't get it published. Right. So they had all this stuff laid out. They just couldn't get it published. It was in the, it was in the style of another book that was popular called uh, a field guide to the little people. Like if you pick up a field guide to the little people, it's the field, the the field guide in the secret is almost a carbon copy of that book. Um, Okay. But it's, yeah, but it's more sat, it's more satire than like fairy tale. The field guide to the little people is like a fairy tale sort of book. And, and the secret's more satire aimed at a more adult audience. Um, and it seems like that's what they were trying to do. They were kind of trying to parody this book, but they couldn't find a publisher for it. And Byron back then was less acting like a publisher when he made the secret and more acting like a packager. Right. So he took, he took their, their book idea and packaged it inside of a treasure hunt. So with most of the book being written, I would say there's not, if there are any clues back there, there are not a lot. Um, because most of the book was already published or most of the book was already written. Right. Byron could have went back and gave them notes and, you know, put this here, put this there. Um, it's possible. I think the, uh, the field guides written really weird. It's written unlike many books where each page, instead of it being a page of text is two columns of text. I think that's a little odd. I feel like if I were going to be searching for clues, I would be looking at that format, right? I would be looking at ways to take, say the first two letters of a word and match them with the first two letters of another word, see if it comes up with a, you know, a completely different word that, or a phrase or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Just because of the way the book's formatted. Well, and it's interesting too, because it takes two things to, to get the treasure, right? So the book says all you need is a verse and a, and a painting, right? Yeah. It says that's all you need, but that does, it doesn't say that's all that's available to you. Sure. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. The way, the way people are using the fair guide to pick out little words, like, uh, what was it? The Chicago world's fairy, um, says something about a ball field, right? So people are like, well, that must be alluding to Boston. Well, Look, you any sufficiently length book, you can just pick out little words and say this is a clue, right? Um, there's something called like the Bible code where people take, you know, rearrange the the Bible in a certain way to make phrases. Like you can you can do that with any any sufficiently long book. That doesn't necessarily make it a clue. Um, clues need to be repeatable, and you know, you know, I haven't seen anybody do anything with the field guide that adds anything new. Right. Right. And if you were to find 
a method in the field guide for, for providing clues, it should provide you with something new. Right. So can you give me, just clarify the timeline for me a little bit then. The, the, so Byron had, had the paintings and, and the verses finished when he approached the guys making the f- field guide. Is that how that works? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I can't, or is there speculation together. on that? Yeah. Um, I, I, I feel like, um, I feel like the field guide was written before that. That's sort of the, the impression that I get. Um, from you know everything that i know i feel like uh sean and ted wrote the field guide independently but they all sort of worked together so byron knew what was going on and byron wanted to sort of mimic the masquerade but he couldn't just release a book of 12 poems and 12 paintings so he had to package it with something else um i feel like that's how it happened but i don't know it's purely speculation what do you think like why do you think he couldn't just release the paintings and the verses as a book well who wants to buy that and who wants to pay 20 bucks for you know six pages i suppose 12 pages or whatever right. um that'd be a really really tiny book um that's you know my only thought yeah i suppose it wouldn't be much material <laughs> Um, okay. Uh, are there other hunts that you're involved in uh, or would recommend to others that you're, that are not the secret? I really like cicada. It's not really a hunt. Um, and it's at a standstill. Uh, so if anybody likes extremely complicated puzzles, um, I like cicada, uh, uh, the beacon star, the beacon star is really good. Uh, I haven't gotten very far into that. Um, but a bunch of the people who, who help with the podcast are working on it. Um, those are about the only two that I really get into. I don't have time to look at other puzzles. Um, uh, Phil, Phil Abbott released a puzzle that was, that was good. I looked at for like two days before I had to stop. Uh, that's my, my downfall. Like I would, I love puzzles. I always have, I've always been involved in a puzzle of some sort, but the secret takes up so much of my time now. I, I don't, I just don't have time. Um, how would you say treasure hunting has been affected by this late, the pandemic, if at all? By the pandemic? Yeah. Um, people seem to, I think it's making people bond, you know, I, I look at the pace, Facebook pages before the pandemic and I see like a lot of people arguing about, you know, the intricacies of whatever solution and whether or not it's correct or whatever. And then as soon as the pandemic hit, it stopped and people started memeing a little bit, people started posting just like random, you know, unrelated stuff to the pages and it caused people to bond and it caused people to sort of learn more about each other and, and form little like microcosm friendships or whatever. Uh, so if the pandemic did anything, if people sitting at home on their computers and these Facebook groups did anything, it, it brought them a little closer together, which is nice. Right that in itself is a slight treasure yeah where do you where do you stand on on what uh expedition unknown did to this particular search Ooh. um you know i think it did good and bad things um i think i think it brought a lot of attention to the hunt it brought a lot of smart people into the hunt it brought a lot of good ideas into the hunt uh, even like as much as the old members don't want to admit it, more progress has been done in this hunt in the past three years than in, you know, the 10 before it, uh, more new ideas, more creative ways of thinking, um, interesting hunters and, and cooperation. Um, that's been, that's been the upside, you know, the downside is everybody wants to be famous. Now everybody wants to be on TV. Um, and because of that, some people backstab each other. Some people talk a lot of shit, whatever. Um, that's the downside. We never, the secret community never had that problem before. We never had a reason to doubt anyone else. Um, we never had a reason to, you know, be sneaky. Um, and that's the, that's the, the biggest downside, just people wanting to be famous and you know, what's it going to get you? It's going to get you on TV for, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes and nobody's going to care, right? Aside from the people in this community, nobody's going to care. Like Jason Krupat, he didn't make a million dollars. Nobody outside of this community knows who that dude is. You know what I'm saying? Well, and half of us in the community don't really know who he is. (laughs) Exactly. Nobody know who Brian and Andy are. You know what I'm saying? Like this isn't, it's not, you're not going to, you know, solve this thing and be Josh Gates. 
You're just not. Um, so yeah, the, everybody wanting to be famous is just the worst thing that, that it brought in. Right. The ego. Yeah. And a lot of uh, ego really, really drives a lot of people in this hunt and that's bad, right? This puzzle will not be solved by one person. You know, no, there's no Josh Cornell out there. That's going to solve them all. Um, <laughs> it's going to take a community of people and until people get over themselves and realize that, you know, but there's good and bad. Like I said, there was a lot of good that came from me. So you mentioned progress. Yeah. Um, can you kind of expound on that? Like what, what would you say is, is one of the biggest um, aha moments the community has had in the last few years? That damn Japanese book. That's the biggest one. Uh, that Japanese book changed everything and it would not have happened if it weren't for you. Somebody coming in from EU, you know, just happened to have a different idea. Let's look for the secret in a different way. Oh, what's this in Japan that blew this treasure hunt wide open. Um, that was, that was on par with Robert Fox finding latitude and longitude coordinates. Like Robert Fox founded latitude and longitude coordinates in the painting. And all of a sudden we knew the correct cities. That was, that was a bombshell for this hunt. The Japanese, the Japanese book was the exact same way. How was that discovered? What the Japanese book? Yeah. <laughs> do you know detail at all about that or can I you do, expand I do, on that? I do. I know, I know exactly how it was discovered. Oh, okay. um, I'll have to, I'll, so I'll tell you, but I'll have to get his permission or I'll cut it out. So a guy named Golden Gate right. um, was just looking around the internet um, for, you know, he was just doing his normal hunt and he decided to look. <laughs> and when he did that, he was just scrolling th- and he saw a copy of the Japanese book. So he sent a he sent a DM to the person who was like, "What the hell is this book?" Uh, and she messaged. It was a girl. She messaged him back. She was like, "Oh, it's this book that my family's had forever, and I just thought it was cool and it had cool art." And um, he was like, "Well, let's compare it to my book." And and he sent her pictures, and and she emailed. She messaged him back, and she's like, "Yeah, it's exactly the same, except for the hint section." And he's like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, what? <laughs> the hint <laughs> section?" Um. So yeah, that's, that's how it happened. It was it, like, that's no, crazy. I mean, malted Falcon as, as good as he is in this hunt. And as long as he's been doing, he's not going to troll, it, you know, right. Uh, that's what I mean by EU bringing in new ideas, new ways of looking at things. Sure. That's really yeah. cool. So that would be the biggest yeah. one. What else would you say? We've, to me, we've just, to me, to me, that's the biggest one. Um, I think, uh, I think EU fostered in, in on one hand it created a sort of a divide, but on the other hand, it fostered a community unlike the secrets ever seen. Right. And that, that community thinking together and working together, at least for the first like two episodes of EU, it kind of fell apart on the third, but the first two episodes of EU, that community thinking and working together uh, just propelled the hunt forward not in huge ways not in uh japanese book sort of bombshell ways but it it moved the hunt forward in small minute changes and finds like the montreal thing right yeah like the 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 fertility yeah yeah uh well i mean the community really didn't do that um i just mean like uh like boston right if it weren't for eu we would still be looking at, at the at Charles Gate. We just right. would. It was it was um, Adrian Krasnicki. I can't pronounce his last name. Um, if it wasn't for EU bringing in Adrian Krasnicki, whatever his last name is, um, <laughs> and him him writing a random article going, you know, it's in the North End, right? Because here's the zip code, and then me like bashing it, like I could have totally bashed him. Um, if it weren't for EU bringing him in. We, nobody would have ever looked at the North End. Nobody had looked at it before. Right. You know, in 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 Quest for Treasure, if you go back far enough, people pointed out the uh, home plate, but they were always like, "It's Fenway's home plate." You know, no one ever looked at the North End until that happened. That's what I mean. Little tiny changes post EU led to a cask. Right. Because you mentioned in. Uh... I think it was the, the podcast that you did when Boston was found. Um, you'd mentioned that there was 
a guy that had this idea or whatever and that it was all in the north end and then as far as we know it on the outside this jason krupat is that how you pronounce his name i think so right so <laughs> you know he kind of shows up into the picture and now he's the guy that found it but originally was it adrian that was the guy and you don't have to include this in the interview this is kind of more so for I, me I, I don't remember I, okay. I don't think adrian was at the ball fields but i'm not right. sure there were that was that was a popular a theory wasn't it Kind of, yeah. There there were several people at the ball field. And it was really weird. Right before the Boston episode came out, before we even knew they were filming one or before we knew they had found something there, a lot of people just randomly started posting about those ball fields. Um, there was some a couple of posts on Reddit, a couple of posts on Facebook. So it was obvious people were looking there. Right. Um, but it was, it, like I said, it was, it was all of the sudden. Yeah. And, you know. It was very sudden. Yeah. And nobody, like I said, nobody's really sure why Adrian got, uh, or not, not Adrian. Nobody's really sure why, um, Jason got that nod. I'll say that the stuff that I've read before, nobody was in the right ball field. Uh, right. I think the guy on Reddit was in the right ball field, but other than that, everybody else was at like Landon park or wherever right. they weren't in the right ball field. So it's possible. He was the only one that was like, it's in the middle one. Right. There was, yeah, I saw a video recently of on Reddit of a guy who actually, I think it was like a couple months prior to Boston being found, he had actually stood where he thought it was. And it was, I think, about four or five yards away from home plate on the third third baseline, I think it was. Um, that was the guy we had on the podcast who went in his long, like right before the EU episode came out, went in his long uh, theory. And he was, it was sort of right. He was a couple of feet away, but you know, whatever. It, it, it was just odd to me that all of the sudden, right before Boston came up, all of these people were like, it's in this park. Right. And what then do you think found. that means? I mean, I don't think it means anything. I think it was coincidence, but yeah, <laughs> um, there's, there, God, there's so many conspiracy theories out there about Boston. Like it was a yeah. plant and it's not a real cask and like whatever. Um, if, if John Jude Palancar sat up and, and, told you how the clues point to a ball field in Boston. He, he sent in an email to me uh, as soon as, so the, the thing, how it went was um, how the story goes, I guess uh, a couple of weeks before uh, EU started recording, uh, I got an email that a cask had been found. So I emailed expedition unknown and expedition unknown was like, we don't know anything about this. Uh, then later on when I was sent the picture of the cask after like once all the news started breaking, I emailed Palancar and I was like, Hey, there's word that uh, a cask has been found in a ball field in Boston. Um, and I want to make an announcement about it, but I can't put my reputation on the line unless it's at least plausible. Yeah. Can you tell me if this idea is plausible or not? And he was like, I don't think there's a you know cask in Boston. And I was like, all right, whatever, John. So I emailed him this picture of the cask. <laughs> I emailed him a picture of the cask and he's like, holy shit. Um, he's like, uh, he's like, can I share this with Josh Gates? And I was like, well, I think he already knows, but you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't remember how the conversation progressed, but he ultimately told me, he was like, look, man, I kind of like, I, I painted the painting. I knew it was in a ball field. Right. And I knew it was in Boston, but he's like, how many ball fields could there be in Boston? I had no idea where this thing was. Yeah. Um, so if, if Palancar can stand up there and tell you, how the painting points to a ball field. If he can say in an email, I knew it was in a ball field. And if Joe Ellen controlling can say, when I emailed the pictures to Joe Ellen, her response was, it's so nice knowing that children played over my art for so long without knowing it was there. <laughs> it feels strange. I can imagine. If Palancar tells you the, the clues point there and he knew there was one somewhere in Boston, Joe Ellen says, this is the cast that she made. Then it's real. You know, right. there's no, yeah. there's no grand scheme. EU didn't, you know, make a mold of a cask and bury it in a random ball field just for views. No. Well, and I, you know what? There was one thing I did enjoy about that Boston episode, and it was that they didn't make it look like Josh found it. You know. Yeah, yeah, they painted that story really well. Yeah, I liked it. It was it was probably. I mean, I've only watched maybe like, you know, Newsflash. I'm not a huge Expedition Unknown fan. I've I've seen literally four episodes um i've seen all three secret episodes and i've seen the golden owl but 
like I think they did a really good job. The Boston one was probably the best one I've ever seen. Right. That's saying a lot because I got friends in some of the others. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you talk to him much? A decent amount. We just kind of bullshit though. Not really. Like that's the thing. A lot of people uh, accuse me of having like these inside information to be because I talk to people. Like I'll talk to Palancar, I'll talk to Joellen, or I'll talk to Kit. But yeah. we never talk about the puzzle. Is that a, a mutually agreed thing where it's just like we don't talk about it, or it just doesn't come up? Uh, both, I think. Like, how old are you? Thirty-six. Okay, so how interested would you be? in conversations that deal with something you did like 20 years ago when you were like, you know, six or when you were, uh, uh, 16, you know, well, I'm the nostalgic type. So I, I might not be the right one to ask, but I understand your point. Yeah. So if I talk to Joelle and it's about her art or, you know, whatever, we had a long, we had a long conversation about a, a piece of art she had, I forget the name of it, but it's two oyster shells staring at the ocean. I think it's called like bedtime or something. And we had a, we had a long conversation about how it made me think about me and my son, um, like putting him to bed or standing. It, like it seems like it, the painting makes me feel like a father leading his son off to adventure and and teaching him how to uh, how to uh, progress and how to approach the world that's in front of him. Right. Uh, and we had a long conversation about that, and she sent me the painting. <laughs> like it was oh, wow. it was nuts. Yeah, it's nice. hang, it's it's hanging up right beside my son's uh, bedroom door. But that's the kind of conversation we have, right? We don't we right. don't talk about the secret. Like these people no. don't care about a project they did forty years ago that they got paid nothing for. Nothing for, yeah. <laughs> um, no, you talk a lot about the artists. Do you see a lot of his art from like not not within the secret? Because I know he does a lot of um, fantasy book covers and things like that. And his paintings themselves are often quite fantastical. Um, do you see a lot of that within the secret? Like his his techniques kind of thing. Like, Do you see a lot of his art techniques that he uses for his own work within this? Or do you think he was kind of limited by exactly what Byron wanted? His techniques, no. Because he was so young when he did this. I, I don't think he had developed fully as an artist. He did, hadn't developed his style fully. You see elements, right? You see elements of his later art in his secret art. Um, you see like, like the rose in the San Francisco painting is a carbon copy of basically every rose he's ever painted. The mountains in the San Francisco painting are a carbon copy of, uh, there's a painting called um, Satan's school. I think's what it's called. Um, it's in is is in his book Origins, and the meaning the the meanings the mountains in that painting are exactly the same as the mountains in the San Francisco painting. Um, oh, interesting. What's really interesting is if you look at his art, you see nods to the secret in other pieces of art. Like there's a I won't tell you which one. We'll make it a game. See if you can find it. There's a cask painted in one of his other paintings. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Cool. What I see more, what I see, what uh, the elements I see more in um, the secret paintings are him giving nods to other artists, like the Florida painting being sort of a nod to one of Dolly's uh, works and, and some of the stuff in the San Francisco painting being a nod to, you know, other art. Like that's what I see more in, in secret, not, not his current style sort of bleeding over, but him giving nods to other artists. Have you talked to him about that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's mentioned like um, he said that the uh, the Chicago painting was inspired, oddly enough, by a Monty Python movie, uh, um, and that's it, re, and things like that are the reasons I try to tell people like don't don't look too deep into this. There's not yeah. huge deep connections to things like no. Um, what else do I want to know? See, because I was looking at this from like a perspective of the kind of the whole community at first, but so I didn't really take time to think of questions that I would like to ask George. <laughs> I got time, man. I got time. Um, let's think here. So I've been working with uh, Fax a little bit over the last few months um, and feel free to edit out his name in this part, but um, we've, we're both staunch uh, verse fivers, right? Lane 222 and all that. And yep. we've started to come up with, the, with well, I should say it was definitely more him than me contributing. We've been talking about um, the idea that it's at Mount Stephen. 
uh, in yeah. the in the like if you're looking at Mount Stephen, there's the two yards, the one on the left and the one on the right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably the one on the right. That's a weird. That's kind of where we're at too, because the and I just want to understand, make sure that I'm not thinking outside of the proper box here. But the the leg eater in the image is to the left of the fleur de lis. Yeah. Do you think like verse five definitely seems to be one of those standing still looking around kind of verses? Yeah. I would think so. I don't, I don't, I don't know that for a fact. I know that once you get like, you, you just can't get too complex um, in, re, in regards to the painting, at least like the he, he man didn't have a lot to work with. No. Um, but yeah, you just, you can't like, Boston screwed up the way people look at these paintings, man, with him trying to tell stories and, ugh, and yeah. you, like you wouldn't have been able to figure out any of the stuff in the Boston painting without him telling you, you know, right. Um, what, what's going to end up being important is Montreal is that exact image, the leg eater, the fertile flirt- you can't find them anywhere else. No. In that combination anyways. Yeah. 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 It's going to be somewhere around there. I don't know if you got to draw lines or whatever. I think you, I think the white stone being gone screws you guys up. I don't know. Yeah, what what was that? That was something in the sidewalks, wasn't it? I don't know. Um, there there used to be a picture of uh, on in that right field. There was a flower bed that was a bunch of stones arranged in like an oval. I always kind of thought it was that, um, but I have no idea. It's kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum than Houston, right? Like Houston's difficult because of how precise and how, you know, like as far as we know, there's so much information in the image and in the verse and stuff like that. Whereas with Montreal, you know, it's difficulty lies in the fact that there's not a lot given to you even in the verse or the image, right? Especially the image. Well, at least that we know of now, right? In in 1982, that might have been completely different. Um, but yeah, it, it seems there really do seem to be verses where it's just like, you have to be standing at the right spot and then everything makes sense. And Montreal verse seems to be that kind of verse. It doesn't seem to lead you anywhere. Um, it seems to just be describing things you should see. And none of those things are there anymore. So it's tricky. I still want to look underground somewhere, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're uh, not, you're not, you, you, have you, have you gone past the shadow theory? You know what? Actually, that's something you and I kind of need to discuss because I never actually had a shadow theory. Um, I had an idea that because the the hands were doing the church thing and that that was underneath everything in the image, that it was under underground or underneath everything. Oh, um, I, th- I, th- I thought you said something about a light pole that was underground that a shadow pointed towards a planner. No, no, that wasn't me. <laughs> oh, well, oops. But no, that's fine. It's it's not even an issue. But uh, no, I never. My craziest theory has always just been that it's either in a like I, it's indoors somewhere, right? Because it's there's nothing to say. Like all the other pictures have something to do with outside. Like even New Orleans with the clock has the star and the moons and all that, and or sorry, the moon and the stars and all that, and you know all of them have something indicating outside except for image nine. Right. And so I had the idea that maybe like, and I always, I always go back to this when I was, I went to Victoria, British Columbia once. If you ever get a chance to go, you absolutely have to, it's gorgeous. Um, And they have these places that are like, they're inside, but there's no roof in like you walk down these alleys and to your left and right, you'll see fl- like flower shops and restaurants and things like that, but there's no ceiling. Right. And you're technically inside of a hallway. And it just kind of made me like seeing that image made me kind of think of that because every, all the other ones are, are thought to be buried outside in parks and things like that. So, you know, as outside as you can get with still being inside were hallways like this. Right. And so I just kind of always thought about it like that, that it has to be, I think it's indoors somewhere or, you know, that, uh, so the black blotch, the shape of the black blotch on Montreal, like on the fleur de lis, do you think the shape of that is relevant? Fun fact. Uh, so the paintings that weren't in EU, um, I was told they weren't shown in EU because if you were to see them, it would give it away uh, immediately. Um, really? the paintings that you didn't see were what St. Augustine, New York, Houston, uh, Charleston, right? Those were the four you didn't see. Yeah. Um, 
and was told that they would give them away immediately. Now, we know that's not true because we've seen Houston. We've seen St. Augustine. We don't know where those things are. It didn't right. give it away immediately. Um, yeah. But I asked. I was like, uh, I, I, back. this was back before we had, we had seen any of the paintings, so we didn't know anything had been covered up. But I right. was like, you know, I, I kind of think that the square is covering the fort. And I kind of think there's something weird about the New York image because that church is painted weird. Um, and we know things are covered up because we've seen the fur de Lee and the Montreal painting. And I was stopped. It was like, wait, wait, what, what are you talking about? And I was like, well, in EU, the Montreal painting was shown. And in the book, it's got a big blob uh, in, inside the square covering a fur de Lee, but in EU, that blob wasn't there. So we know it was added after the fact. Right. And, and John looked at me and went, shit, I forgot about that. So the reason you got to see that Fleur de Lee was because he forgot it was covered up. <laughs> That's sweet. Yeah. Hmm. But, and, and we we're also told the other ones, that if you saw them, you would get it right away. And we know that's not true. Yeah. Because we've seen two of them or three of them. We've seen three, three of them. Of them. Right yeah. Well, technically we've seen more like those, when those originals came out, Houston and Montreal were the only two that weren't in there, wouldn't it? And Chicago, I think. No, no, no. The, when the original, so Chicago, uh, John doesn't have, John doesn't oh, okay. have Chicago it was stolen from him. Oh, shit. Um, yeah. We didn't see Cleveland. We didn't see right. Montreal. We didn't see, um, Charleston. Yeah. What others have I not seen? I think that's it. Do you think you, like, that that actually did anything as far as the search goes? I think it did good stuff. I, I really do. Um, you all of a sudden stopped seeing people use magnifying glasses. And dig jacks. All of a sudden. Yeah, just – yeah, dig jacks. It took away dig jacks. Um, <laughs> it, and it, it, it proved something I don't think anybody caught on to. But you can go back and listen to the podcast episodes – Mm -hmm. where most of the new stuff you figured out about the puzzle or like from, from the originals being released has already been told to people. Right. right. When, when, when people like me or Bradley or whoever, when we get information, we put it out. Yeah. Whether you believe it or not, it's up to you. Yeah. But shit like dig jacks, we were able to, def I mean, we said definitively, it does not say dig jacks. Right. Yeah. We said definitively before New York came out that fucking church that's not in the painting, right? Yeah. That color is important. We were able to say these things. So it, it, and I say that because there's a lot of people who are going to be like, well, people had copies of these images and they had inside information, but no, we put the information out there. We mm -hmm. tried to put as much of it as we could out there. Um, whether, you know, whether people paid attention, that was up to them. That's up to um, them. Yeah. Yeah, but I really do. I think it did good things. I think it took people away from using a magnifying glass. It showed people that these images, they're not as helpful as you think they are, right? right. These images are not going to show you where to dig for these casts. They're just going to give you a general area. Right. There's nothing hidden in them. Everything you need to see, you can see. Like that's something else I've been told by people who, who work on the book. Everything you need to see to solve these puzzles, you can see in every single copy of this book, even the reprints. It's clear as day. You just need to know how to look at it. Yeah. yeah, And yeah. And decisively pick out what you want to, or like what's, you know, like the yeah. obvious parts, right? Yeah. Well, well, like Boston, you could see all of the stuff that JJP pointed out in Boston. You just didn't know how to read that painting, you know? And even still having him explain it, I still don't think we know how to read it like that. His no. stuff just didn't make any sense. Yeah, it was hard to follow. And I think a lot of people think that it was uh, kind of tossed together that day, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, was, it wasn't. He was being honest with you. He was like, this is what I remember from the painting. And it, it doesn't go any deeper than that, right? The solution is what it is. It, it's, there's nothing deeper. How long did the community know about, about or even speculate about the, the uh, home plate? on the sleeve. Like I had never heard that prior to just like a week that it happened. I I hadn't either. Like, I, I think Chris pointed out to me that it had been on quest for treasure before. Mm -hmm. That's about it. Um, but it had been speculated before. Yeah. It had been speculated before, mm -hmm. but nobody tied it to that in the town. Everybody was still looking elsewhere in Boston. Yeah. You know? 
Which and is then retarded. Paul Revere happened. Yeah. <laughs> it's a ball field in the Italian section of Boston. Like, come on. Yeah. Like in hindsight, it seems so retarded that no one else looked there, but no one did. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, and like, it's funny because in that sentence, you just said that, you know, it's in a ball field in the Italian part of Boston, you know, that sentence alone ties in a, a possible dig site, the immigration, um, connection or whatever. Right. Yep. And you know what I mean? So, and like Cleveland, it's, it's in a planter right behind this wall. And the Greek cultural gardens. Yeah, right. So like it's and like I always Cleveland I thought is the is kind of the trump card against the argument that the the images aren't as um, useful. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people kind of discount certain things, but Cleveland like one like now that we know everything like like you say you can stand at the start of that little park there and look straight and you are looking at the back of that wall at the fountain at the columns, right? Yeah, but Cleveland's different though. You can't use Cleveland as an example of how to use these paintings because that was John's. That was Palancar, right? That was his hometown. He knew it better than anywhere. So that that pain, it's sort of like how people think New York is hard because it's Byron's hometown and he knows it better than anyone. That spot was obvious in the painting because it was John's hometown. And he knew it better than anyone. So he could paint everything exactly the way you need to see it and whatever. He wasn't working off the of Polaroids for that one, the way he was for the rest of them. So it's going to be more visually descriptive. So John knows some of them, if not just that one, right? I don't think so. I really think, I think what you have to remember is this was a project 40 years ago for an artist, right? And we all work. We all have projects at work. Like how much do you remember about a specific project from 10 years ago? Right. Not a lot. People Not have lot, to yeah. sort of jog your memory for you to get little snippets of, of memories. I, I think that's the same for him. This wasn't sort of a grand, uh, life defining or, you know, ar- artistically defining moment for him. This was a, this was a gig. Somebody paid him to paint some paintings and he, 40 years ago he doesn't remember as much as people would like him to right yeah that's i think that's the big uh you know disclaimer if you will is that it's what people want him to remember kind of thing like what i the way i kind of see it i agree that it's a project from 40 years ago and it's you know a guy asked for some paintings but there's some very specific things about these paintings you know what i mean and that sort of i think I would hope anyways, that those are the things that stick out to him the most is, you know, like he remembers what was clues and what wasn't kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure he remembers that because like, if you're going to paint a painting, if an artist is going to paint a painting, he's going to paint it sort of, he's going to have sort of the same vision for that painting five years from now or 10 years from now or whatever. So he's going to, when he looks at a painting, he's going to look at that painting and be like, this is not something I would paint unless I was told to paint in there. So I'm sure he could pick out. um, I'm sure he could pick out what the clues were. I'm not necessarily sure he could tell you what they were supposed to be. Right. Or where the cask is necessarily or anything. Yeah. 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 I think John could put you in a city, Mm -hmm. but I, I, I think he was honest when he was talking about Boston. Like he's like, I knew it was in Boston. I kind of remember it was in a ball field, but how many ball fields are there in Boston? You know? Well, exactly. Yeah. I know I once uh, brought up Fort Raleigh and he was like, what the hell is Fort Raleigh? Yeah. And I was like, Oh, it's this, this is park in North Carolina with it. Oh, oh okay. Like <laughs> he, he, it's, it's, it's re- it really is. It's a pro it's a project he did 40 years ago and he just doesn't remember yeah, it just wasn't important enough for him back then to be sort of etched in his memory. Well, and I'm sure Byron was pretty vague about everything too, right? Like he said, he probably just told him, "There's a ball field in Boston, and this is what I want you to put." Right? Like he yeah, or, you know, probably. But even if he wasn't, even if he was super specific and told him, you know, all of the plans, you fall back on that. It was 40 years ago, and who the hell knows? <laughs> yeah. He's probably smoked a little bit since then. Yeah. He's an interesting cat, that John Pellencar. Yeah, he's a good dude. Really good dude. Very sweet, genuine. Um, yeah. He's an artist. Yeah. They weird. generally are. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Anything else? Anything else you want to know? Any history of the podcast or the hunt in general? 
You know what? I want to, I do. There is one thing I've, I've wanted to ask you for a long time. And okay. because see, no. And I started to ask you this once before. I remember I asked you a few weeks ago, whether you've ever studied psychology before, because mm -hmm. you talk to people kind of like you have. Mm -hmm. Do you remember me saying that? Well, I do. There is something like you have this magic, I think that you do. And, and this is, doesn't necessarily have to go into the interview, but it's pretty interesting in my opinion that you, are able to help people piece together clues and help them put together a theory. And you have offered ideas, many ideas on, on what certain clues and that could mean. But through all the podcasts and all the page stuff that I've read of yours, not once have I ever seen you say, this is my theory on X. Nobody ever asks that. I Well, and that's, that's kind of part of it, but what's your theory on St. Augustine? Uh, I think it's buried at the amphitheater. I don't think it's buried at the, the fountain of youth. Um, I absolutely really? 100% do not think it's buried at the fountain of youth. No. Um, and, and you're right. I have never really given my ideas to anyone and it's basically because no one ever asks, right? Uh, people come to me all the time with their own ideas and like, what do you think of my ideas? And I tell them, or I help them with whatever, but no one ever comes to me and says, George, what are your thoughts on X, what are your thoughts on Y? What, what, you know, so I just, I don't give them out. Do you want to do something like that here? Like we, I can ask you straight up. What is like, what's your theory on San Fran? What's your theory on Houston? Or, you know what I mean? My theory, my theory on St. Augustine is, is at the amphitheater, um, right around that big ass rock. Uh, it's the only perfect visual match besides the fort that we have. Um, St. Augustine and the forts just, it's too vague. It's, it's like the water tower, you know? right? It's got to be a city thing. Um, the only other thing you've got is that rock and it's an exact match. So it has to be buried somewhere there. Now where there, I have no idea. Um, that park was just, it's been through so many changes since the eighties. It, it's been demolished like twice, you know, um, nothing, nothing is there anymore. The, the layout's not there. The, the, there is an actual park like a, with walking trails and whatever at, at the amphitheater. And that even that's different. Um, the signs are all gone and the park isn't even named the same thing. The, and there's no images from the eighties of that general area. So I have no idea what the park looks like. I have no idea how the clues work. What I know is in that painting, there is an obvious thing that's not the fort. And it's the only obvious thing in the painting. Therefore the cask is probably somewhere with inside of that. That's my idea in St. Augustine. Um, there's a lot of stuff at the Fountain of Youth that sort of matches. Um, but, and they, they match if, like, if you're solving St. Augustine from New York, right? Uh, for the first chapter, that's a pretty big clue. You know, that's not in, it, it's in some other places in St. Augustine, but not a lot of them. Um, Saloy is a pretty big clue to the Fountain of Youth. That's, that really only exists in the Fountain of Youth. What is that? Uh, so the Saloy uh, is a is a basically a tribe of Indians, right? Um, the the Indians that existed in this section of Florida were called the I'm going to butcher this the Timucuans, I believe. And within the Timucuan tribe of Indians, there was a town. There was the town of Saloy, and the town of Saloy existed inside of the Fountain of Youth, and maybe like a mile north of the Fountain of Youth. It was it wasn't a very big town. Um, and it was theoretically where Ponce de Leon landed and planted his cross and whatever. Um, but that's what that is. If you go to the Fountain of Youth, there's a lot of stuff about the Saloy Indians. But then again, at the amphitheater, they have a play about the Saloy Indians, you know? And the play is in the exact same sort of amphitheater as the Lost Colony play in North Carolina. And it's written by the same dude that wrote uh, the Lost Colony in North Carolina. Um, it's got the same boat, like the Lost Colony in North Carolina had a boat behind the stage on tracks where the sails would pass, right? They would have a makeshift boat on tracks and they would push it past the stage. St. Augustine's got the same thing. Like there, you could make a connection. Like there's so many connections between that amphitheater in St. Augustine and the amphitheater in North Carolina. It's nuts. Um, um, things like shell, limestone, silver salt, right? Those are on signs at the fountain of youth, but they're on signs everywhere in Florida, right? Shell and limestone makes coquina. And this entire town is built out of coquina. If you have any sign that about a building 
made out of coquina, it's probably going to have the word shell and limestone in it. Um, it's probably going to have salt. Silver is a little different. Um, but so you've got all these connections to Fountain of Youth, but they're they're sort of loose and they can be applied to other places. Um, can they be applied to the amphitheater? I don't know, because all of the signs are gone. Everything's, you know, I just don't know. But yeah, that's my idea of St. Augustine. Um, probably at the amphitheater, because that's the only place you can see a one for one copy of, of something in the painting. Right. Do you have like full theories on other cities? I had a full theory on, well, I mean, New Orleans, but we put that in the podcast um, at Gallier Hall. Uh, same with Charleston. I, I put my theory for Charleston in between those two things and the one at the bench on the podcast. Uh, I got one for San Francisco, but I can't go into it. Um, what about New Montreal, York? Or Mil, Mil, New York, I have no idea. I have no mm-hmm. idea. I, it's so it's so difficult to me that I don't look into it much. Yeah. Um, and, and the weird thing is a lot of my ideas follow old people's ideas, right. you know, in Milwaukee. Yeah. I, I think, I think we're right digging in Lake park. Right? Mm-hmm. I, I like that solve. I like that solution. So I don't change it. It's not mine. I mean, it, it's, it's my, it's where I want to dig, but I didn't come up with the solution. If that makes right. sense. Yeah. Totally. Um, so yeah, th- that's another reason why I don't put forth this is my idea because mine fall in line with other people's a lot of the time. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. Cuz yeah, it was it was just something that dawned on me a little while ago. I was like, I've never I wonder where George thinks these these things are. <laughs> it's it's really weird and I was talking to Rachel about that the other day too. It's like all of these people message me about stuff, but it's it's more that they want to talk at me than it is they want my opinion. If well, I think they sense. want your like they want your approval. I think that yeah, it it, it it does seem to be a lot of approval. Like a lot of people seem to think that if if they and please don't take this the wrong way because you know I respect you a lot, but um, if they can't get Josh Gates, George Ward will do right. Is kind of an attitude I've seen in people, and I they, which is it's shitty, right? Like that's a bad attitude, <laughs> but you know, um. I mean, then that's why, like, partially why I wanted to do the interview too, is because you're like you're a trove of information about this, and even getting your perspective on certain puzzles, like knowing what you where you think they are and why, you know, could is could potentially really help a lot of people. And see, I don't see myself that way. I I really like it's a, uh, it sounds, I don't know, whatever. I I re- I say that I'm just another member of the community. And I really feel that way. Like I don't see myself as a leader. I don't see myself as knowing any more than anyone else does about this puzzle. I legit have the same amount of casks as you do. I don't, I don't, you know, but you've got tenure, but not as much as Matt. So why aren't people going to Matt? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I, I I think of myself as just another member of the community. I, and I mean, I get that, that people see me as something more than that, but I don't know there are other people that they look at, you know, in the same fashion as they do you. But I mean, I always just found you more approachable personally. Right. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to blow sunshine up your ass or anything. I've tried to be that way. Like I've tried from the very first post I ever made about this puzzle was several years after I started working on it. I worked on it on my own for many, for a few years before I made a post. The very first post I made was I'm going to go to St. Augustine and I'll take pictures of anything you want. Just let me know what you want a picture of. And somebody was talking about like the mission to Nombre Dios. And I went and took a bunch of pictures of that. And I took a bunch of pictures of the exit of the Fountain of Youth. And I took a bunch of pictures of the walkway behind um, uh, the, the hotel across from the Fountain of Youth. That was my very first post was let me try to be helpful. And I've tried to carry that on. Like I, 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 I really feel like, like, I truly feel like the only way to solve these is with cooperation and like lead from example here. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I've always tried to be approachable and as helpful as I can. And I think that sort of does set me apart from other people because other people are not that approachable. No, some of it has to do with ego too. Like I think some people are in this to be famous Mm -hmm. and they will let you know that, you know, they'll let you know, that they're better than you and you know, one way or another. Yeah. And I try, like, I don't think I'm better than you and I don't no. care about being famous. So no. it makes me more approachable. I don't know. 
No, it does. It absolutely does. Do you think if Byron was still around, he'd have made a part two? Like, I know there was talk that he was, was going to do that. In fact, it apparently says it in the back of the book. But um, do you think it ever would have happened? You know, I, I've. it's going to suck for people to hear this um, if they get to hear it. It really will. It'll break a lot of illusions that people have. Um, probably out of, out of everybody that I've talked to that's worked with Byron or that knew Byron or was just, just friends with Byron. Like I've, I've talked to Byron's best friend. I have an interview sitting on the shelf with one of Byron's best friends. Um, and I didn't want to publish it because of something the man said, all, all of them say essentially the same thing. Byron didn't have a sense of adventure and this book was completely out of character for him to make. Um, and he, he liked his friends and he liked doing cool things and he liked doing stuff for kids, but this treasure hunt was completely out of left field for him. Uh, nobody understands why he made it, you know, um, everybody agrees. Everybody agrees. That yes. He really likes history and yeah, he really wants people to learn things, but everybody, everybody said he has no sense of a sense of adventure. They don't know why he made this. Um, That's funny. I think, yeah, it's, it's a little nuts. Uh, the people who worked on the book, everybody sort of <laughs> complains about this book. Right. I think it, was, I think it turned out to be number one, it didn't make any money. Mm-hmm. And number two, it became a headache. Right. Um, it became a big headache for him later on in his life. So mm-hmm. no, I, I don't think he would have made one just for that reason. I mean, there was 20 years in between the publishing of this book and, and when he died, if he was going to make another one, he would have. He would have by now. Yeah, make anything sure. even close to it. What did he do since the secret? Uh, I mean, he published, he did a lot in comics. Um, right. I mean, he, 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 Byron price publication published a shitload of books. Right. Um, he did like the, the, the beach boys book and the Seinfeld book and the one book for the chick that with the chimps, I forget her name. Jane oh, Goodall. Uh, yeah. Jane uh, Goodall. Yeah. Um, he published a lot of books. He did a lot of stuff in comics. Um, and he worked with a lot of people, but he never did anything close to a treasure hunt. Right. The one question that I, that has come up now that I can think of is if you think that it's at the amphitheater, why was the meetup at the fountain of youth? Because that's where most people want to go. <laughs> You're so accommodating, George. <laughs> well, I mean, it is. And like, it's like John Frazier's there and he wants to meet everybody and everybody wants to go check out the Fountain of Youth and everybody has all of these questions. That was, that was my main goal with the Fountain of Youth was to answer questions. Um, I went to, I went to John Frazier um, when, before the whole idea for the meetup came up, I went to Frazier and I was like, look, uh, he, he told me he's getting mail and email. 10, 10 emails a day, a couple of physical letters a day. And he's like, they're all asking the same questions about the same places in this park. He's like, I wish I could just give everybody the answer at once. And I was like, well, why don't we just do a podcast? We'll just do an interview. We'll do an interview about the park. We'll do the history, blah, blah, blah. And that's what we planned. And that evolved into after we did the San Francisco meetup, we're like, well, why don't we just do a meetup? And we can do a tour and then we can do an interview and everybody can answer all of his, your questions or everybody can ask all of the questions you can answer them. And then you never have to respond to those emails again. Like nobody will ask you again. Um, and he was like, great, let's do that. So we planned it. That's how it came up. It was really to like, it was, I get all these questions and the same questions and I just want to answer them once. Like, okay, we can do that. Yeah. That's genius in a lot of different ways. Yeah, but after I mean after the meetup, I went off with other hunters. We went we went to the amphitheater with a couple of people and talked about it. Um, we went off and saw some other people's little parks, like uh, the uh, it's not St. Jude. Um, I forget which park it is. Uh, a, a Saint downtown. We went and looked at you know the slave market downtown. So we visited other places. This just the the official meetup was at the Fountain of Youth. See, and it's funny because like. Fountain of Youth is is like a it seems such like such a perfect um, place right for the whole thing, yeah. And you know like that's why it's so interesting to me that when I asked you where you think it is, it wasn't there, right? Like that's because no. it just all. makes too much sense, right? Uh, 
Well, actually, I, let me rephrase I, that. I don't think that it makes it. Like I said, it's just so convenient that it could be it's there. It's convenient. It's convenient. Yeah. 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 But, you know, at some in some ways, I fall into the camp that Byron wouldn't bury it somewhere you got to pay to get into. I think he could uh, very easily sneak in and not realize it's a paid park. But, you know, I just don't know. I can't get past. There's nothing in this painting that's obvious except the fort and that rock. That that's obviously something else. What is what is obviously the fort? The fort's in the flag. Oh, okay. Uh, now that we've seen the paintings, we know right. the fort's in the flag. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but the only other thing is is that rock, and the fort is a half a mile from the Fountain of Youth. That rock is two miles from the Fountain of Youth. They're completely different ends of the city. See, that's interesting because, like, I was when I was talking to John a little while ago, we I had mentioned how we were talking about the black spot on the fleur de lis, and I thought I, I mentioned how I thought it looked like a kind of an aerial view of Mount Stephen Club um, building because it was painted a certain way. Like, he could have just made it a black square, but he made it a very distinct shape, right? I was told, take this with more of a grain of salt than any other I was told because of who said it, but I was told that it's a layout it's like a like an overhead view of a building of a place like a floor yeah. plan yeah that's kind of what i meant yeah like a bird's eye view of because if you look at the shape of um mount stephen club from above it does it's really really close to that black spot <laughs> right because there's that little absence in the bottom there and that to me looks like the in between the two yards right when 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 I was told the overhead view, I was shown like a like Google image search of church floor plans, and it was like like this. I was like, oh okay, but I don't I don't know I don't I wouldn't bank on that. I would take that with a huge grain of salt. But that's what I was told. Is there a lot of information you know about the secret that you can't like you can't straight up tell people? Yes and no. Um, none that will help you find a cask. I go back to that email that I sent to Palancar trying to verify Boston. Right. And the response I got was there's no cask in Boston. Right. Um, I don't know if the things I know are lies. And I know that the people who, who work on this hunt, if you outright ask them a question, they will lie to you. Like Byron's done it numerous times. John Palancar's done it numerous times. Um, so I hesitate to tell anyone anything that I know because I don't know if it's true. And you see how people hold on to that email from Byron who said when he said there's no treasure buried in Central Park, right? That takes Central Park completely off of the, you know, completely off the map. Nobody looks there. But what if that's a lie? Like he said, there's no cask in Chicago. We know that was a lie. Why? Why can't um, Central Park be a lie? Imagine if I came out and said John Palancar said there was a cask in St. Louis. Exactly. Yeah. You know <laughs> that would that would be concrete, and we would have no idea if that's a lie or not. No. So just that he said I it. Had, yeah. My my goal with getting verification for things was not just going to people and saying. Hey, can I have your permission to say that you said this? It was to take a piece of information from person one and take it to person two and say, person one said this, does this jive with what you know? And if they said yes, put that in the true pile, you know? And if they said no, put it in the false pile and then take all of those true things and bundle them up and give them to everybody. But there was really nothing in there that would help you find a cask. Like the closest, the closest thing I could come to was in order to view Charleston's painting correctly, you need to view it at an angle and, uh, perspective's probably important in Houston, you know, it's little stuff like that, but I can't tell you where any of these are buried. I can tell you the city cities are correct. So Yes. Yes. And no. Yes. There's probably something there's, there's things that I know about the secret that most people don't know, but I don't know if any of them are true. <laughs>